Welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19 and Ataxia. I'm Lori Shogren, Community Program and Services Director for the National Ataxia Foundation, and I'll be assisting with today's webinar along with our Communications Manager, Stephanie Lucas. Questions for the webinar speaker can be typed in the questions tab found in your control panel, and we'll answer as many questions as possible before the end time of today's session. As a note, today's webinar is meant to give you more information to assess your personal situation and preparedness. We encourage you to seek out as much additional information and resources as necessary to make informed decisions. We have two of the leading ataxia clinicians today to discuss the novel COVID-19 virus and the impact the global pandemic may have on patients with ataxia. Dr. Pervin Kamani is a neurologist specializing in ataxia at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute Movement Disorders Center. And Dr. Jeremy Schmaman is professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and a neurologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital and is the founding director of the ataxia unit. Now I'll invite Dr. Jeremy Schmaman to start us off with an overview of COVID-19 and precautions we can take to prevent contracting the virus. Welcome, Dr. Schwaman. Thank you, Laurie, and good morning. Good morning to you and to uh, Dr. Kamani and to everybody who's listening in. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to get together and have this conversation uh, with our ataxia community uh, at this time of great stress and challenge uh, that's uh, really uh, turned life upside down for everybody. I think what we wanted to talk about today, and, and Dr. Kamani and I will have a conversation about this, is uh, a set of approaches that we think can be broken down into four big large themes about ataxia in the time of COVID and general health as well in the time of COVID. The first is perhaps most important is how do you, how does one prevent oneself from getting the bug? Uh, so that's the first thing. What can we do as a, as a group, as a community to try and not get infected? Uh, we all have that idea in mind. There are many issues around this. Uh, what's infection? What does it mean if you have it? And so on, we'll come to that. But the first is, uh, what can we do to try and protect ourselves from getting the infection? Uh, and the second is, uh, if you don't get the infection or if one had it and one's asymptomatic, what do you do in the time that has already happened and going forwards for some time now as well, which will be happening for at least a few months, if not longer? What do you do if you have ataxia and all the kind of care that you've been receiving through the years that you've been experiencing this have been interrupted? What does that mean for you now in terms of daily care? What happens to you the now that you're at home or that you're social distancing? What can we do to maximize quality of life? The next thing is what happens if you do get it? What are the symptoms to watch out for? How could it impact you? Uh, what are the things that you and the family should be taking care of to think about how best to maximize your health? And then in the eventuality that somebody gets it and is severely affected, I think it's worthwhile at least thinking about the other end of the spectrum. If one has this and one is in a hospital and one has a severe infection that is happening and taking the lives of so many people who have become infected with, the, with, with this horrible vi uh, virus, uh, what is the role that you uh, and your family members and your ataxia doctor can all play in facilitating optimal care in the hospital by the people in the care teams who are taking care of you and who may not know that much about ataxia or about your ataxia, and also most importantly, know about you and what your wishes are and what you would like uh, the optimal approach to be should you be uh, very ill with ataxia. So this is the, the spectrum of the conversation from you're totally fine, how do I not get the bug, to God forbid you get the bug and you're seriously ill, what are the approaches that you and the family can take to work with the healthcare teams to try and maximize your care and make sure that your wishes are uh, best listened to, taken into consideration, and to provide you the best care possible. So that's how I think that Dr. Kimani and I have thought about the approach to this, and with that I can turn it over to Kevin and we can think about some of the questions that. Uh, uh, we can start with and see what people what questions people have as we go forward. Right, um, and I think the very first question or the very first theme um, 
that you mentioned, Dr. Schmelman, is, is really the, one of the most important ones is how to prevent from getting infected. Um, it, it, in most uh, chronic illnesses, uh, including ataxia, infections can make the underlying illness worse. So it is very important to observe the universal precautions that have been laid out by CDC to prevent infection, including social distancing, um, the hand washing, utilization of a mask uh, when you're around people, um, the wiping of countertops um, with bleach and other disinfectants, um, and just the general precautions that can actually be found now on our National Ataxia um, Foundation website. They will link directly to the CDC's website. You don't have to remember these because they are listed for you. You can always look at them, go down them, and ensure that you're observing every precaution that you can to prevent getting infected. That's the first thing I would say. Um, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Schmaman if he has any other suggestions um, with respect to people having chronic or advanced ataxia, what they can do uh, to prevent being infected other than these universal precautions. No, that's right. I think that one of the things that uh, we can think about is if, if able-bodied people, take you, know, take you and me and, and our families and people who are able-bodied who, who are not dealing with ataxia, we're washing our hands a number of times a day. We're bringing groceries in. We're wiping them down. We're, we're spraying the doorknobs. Uh, we're staying away from, from uh, people at least six feet or more. We're wearing a mask when we go outside. Uh, we're not touching our face or our nose or our eyes or our mouth, um, at least when we're outside and, and before we come home and washed our hands and washed our hands a number of times. Anything that comes into the house, you just disinfect, you wash your hands. You have to imagine that the bug is kind of a dust everywhere and you have to wash that dust off your hands and get it off your clothes. If you go outside shopping, you come back, you wash your clothes. So that's challenging enough for people who are fine in terms of all their motor skills. If you have a taxi and if you're in a wheelchair uh, or if you have trouble getting around and you're using your walker and your hands are on the walker, I think one has to adapt to um, finding ways not to be exposed to that, which is why people are staying home. So when people come into the house, they have to make sure they're not bringing the bug in with them, that, that the, the dust of this virus out there in the, in the environment is not coming into the home. So if you're at home and you, and you have all the disabilities that attacks you can produce for you, then you have to take those steps to prevent somebody else infecting you if you're actually not going out into the world. So these are the kind of things that people will figure out for themselves one at a time, uh, how, how not to get infected. And I think a problem I can hand it back to you with, the, with sort of transitioning to the next stage of this is, uh, if, if you're doing everything you can out there and now you're healthy at home and you have to social distance and you have the ataxia, well, that has a knock-on effect on everything else. Uh, and so many aspects of your life in terms of seeing your doctor and, and having your physical therapy or going to have a blood draw if you have something else going on. So all of these things are, that are relevant and perhaps we can pick it up and, and think about that, try and help people think that through and give some experience we've learned from our own patients about how they're approaching this challenge, uh, which has ch turned everything upside down. Um, Ryan, to, to what you just said, Dr. Shmam, and I'd say that um, controlling infection in you is is one thing but controlling infection and foot traffic that is coming in and out of your home is an entirely different thing so what if you have a home health aide um what if your um, your significant other is a healthcare worker uh, who is working in a hospital and they come in and they have to take care of the person with ataxia as well well we have some specific guidelines thankfully and they, those are also found on the CDC website. Um, you do not discontinue your home health aids if you've got, if you need help, because that is really important. Uh, there is a reason why you, you have a home health aid coming in, um, but there are guidelines that are put out by the um, the National um, Home Health Service, uh, the National Home Health Aid Service that can be followed. That um, that reiterate exactly what Dr. Schmaman said. 
is um, exercising universal precautions right outside the door before you even enter and have close contact with someone who has um, uh, ataxia. Uh, so, you know, please access uh, those links. And I think Lori is displaying those links for you, which are listed under the resources section on the NAF webpage. Now, if you do get infected, and um, Dr. Schmelman is one of the, the foremost authorities who, who can tell us what symptoms to, to look out for. But as a physician, uh, I would say that if there is any change in your baseline health, and, and it could be a symptom that you've never had before, what needs to be confirmed, what needs to be concerned, I'm sorry, about something new going on. Um, so most ataxias don't suddenly get worse overnight. Uh, you, you don't suddenly develop breathing difficulties overnight um, if you have a chronic progressive ataxia. So any change from baseline um, would be would would need needs to alert uh, the patient and the caregiver that something else is going on. And the very first thing I would I would do if this is not an emergency, if you're not having breathing problems, if you're that we ought to look out for if there is a sudden worsening and how can this present this particular virus present with either neurological or non-neurological symptoms um, right you know just uh, I'll, I'll, this is a the word that everybody has used about everything in, in COVID is that everything is fluid uh, the situation changes uh, literally day by day and from the outset, you know, when the hospital would send us notices about what's going on, they'd say, this information is true as of this time, this date, because tomorrow or in two hours time, something could be different. Um, we're going to have a very different scenario when we have blood tests widely available that will tell us if we've been exposed to the virus. Uh, doesn't actually have the bug. Uh, do you have antibodies to, to uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Have we developed antibodies? Were, were we asymptomatically inf infected uh, or had maybe a, a minor sniffle or a runny tummy for a couple of days and that was it? And that was the infection that we had symptomatically and now we have antibodies. That will be very important in changing how we do care and daily life going forwards. Taking temperatures that they've been doing in other countries before you enter a public space uh, will be part of that as well. They're working on something at MGH now to, to assess smell as an indicator of early disease. Now, here's a disclaimer. I've been home since March 13th. I have not seen COVID patients, but I'm reading every day the bulletins that come out of the hospital. And uh, we have webinars with the hospital, people who are in the hospital now. I'm going to be in the hospital on next Monday for two weeks, taking care of people on the inpatient service, both COVID and non-COVID patients. Uh, but they've been keeping everybody at home unless you've been on the front lines taking care of patients. So my knowledge is a theoretical knowledge, and most of us who are not actually on the on the front lines doing this are like that, but there are many of us, uh, the heroic colleagues that we all share, who have been on the front lines taking care of patients. So uh, this is the, the knowledge that I bring to this, is the knowledge of the diseases and the theoretical knowledge of COVID. Uh, and how this could impact uh, everybody. But bear in mind that things will change. When we, when we have a vaccine, this will be like the regular flu. We'll get our vaccine shots. We won't be terrified of this. The fear and the terror and the anxiety is because there are so many unknowns about this virus. Uh, it was thought to be fever and cough and loss of appetite and shortness of breath as the primary problems. And now we've learned that you can get a red toe as because of the, the cutaneous, the skin manifestations or a rash or a headache or seizures or young people who have these massive strokes because the virus is causing a change in the blood clotting system. And people are getting clots in their brain causing stroke or in the kidneys causing renal failure or, or even affecting the heart. Uh, so there are many ways that this virus is manifesting and there are uh, some with ataxia, but this is part of a more generalized brain infection or uh, inflammation that includes both cerebellum and its related systems, as well as the brain upstairs. So the, the symptoms of, of the virus itself, uh, exactly as Dr. Kamani talked about, may be just something different about you. Now, bear in mind that ataxia people can get aspiration pneumonia, so you can get a fever and shortness of breath, and it's not COVID. And we have to make sure that at the same time that you're 
concerned about COVID, we don't shortchange you on the care of your underlying disease. And we can come back to that in a second about in, term, in, in terms of staying in touch with your healthcare uh, providers. But uh, the points that you that you raised, Pavan, so far, I think are, are spot on about people coming into the house, not bringing the infection, making sure that you're uh, taking care of yourself as much as you can. Um, and I think we should probably segue to you're stuck at home, you have ataxia, you haven't got COVID, now what? And uh, what I've been hearing from the people that I talk to in our regular visits on the telephone and the, on the video chat we'll come back to in a second, is that they're basically not doing as much as they used to, and they can tell the difference. And we know now that there's really good science behind the fact that exercise improves ataxia and not exercising makes you get worse. So maybe you've, you've heard that from your patients too, Pratt, right? That you have the similar, similar set of information. We were talking about this yesterday. We have to um, we have to talk about the the effects of staying home, both mentally and physically. Uh, there are always there are always multiple components. Just to unpack it a little bit, let's talk about the physical uh, component. Just like in Parkinson's disease and in ataxia, if you're not mobile. If you're not exercising, you tend to lose some milestones, uh, which is deconditioning, loss of muscle, thinning of bones, etc. And that can happen pretty fast. So um, NAF actually, uh, I was told by Lori, has a fantastic uh, uh, telewebinar on um, exercises at home that people can do who have ataxia, who are um, who cannot go out, for instance. Uh, who are not mobile or who need help going out. There are chair exercises that are available. Um, and so please access that link, uh, which is right on the NAF website. For people who are mobile, and for people who do not have fall problems and who are used to going out on walks, etc., when a taxi is not advanced, if you do take universal precautions of covering your mouth, maintaining social distance of about six feet as is recommended, it is okay to go on walks in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, you got to make sure that you don't fall and you got to make sure that you have your cell phone with you or your fall bracelet with you in case you need to call 911 or, or a family member. But social distancing does not mean social isolation. I think we've been talking about this with respect to ataxia and other conditions uh, in which uh, people are, are homebound. So that is, the, that is the physical component. The mental component is equally, if not more important, is how do you stay mentally connected? How do you be alone together is you know what we are talking about and there are various ways to do it uh you you have your friends your colleagues your family members now's the time for all of us to come to the aid of people who are not able to go out maintain a schedule uh, plan what you're going to do the next day who you're going to call uh you everyone has a phone so please use your phone even if you don't have access to a computer to get in touch with people uh, so that is social connectivity if you have problems with depression and anxiety that are that, are, that tend to get worse um, and I'm going to have Dr. Schmaman talk about the importance of of telehealth in just a second but I'm going to tell you that please connect with your general practitioner and your neurologist and your ataxia specialist if mood is getting worse because that can adversely impact your physical symptoms as well so you've got to take care of both the the mental and emotional aspect um, and the physical aspect. No, I couldn't agree more. I think the, one of the, the lines that we've heard uh, repeatedly from uh, caregivers, from the clergy, people who are uh, concerned about the social, emotional health of our society as we're going through this, is to emphasize that we need to be kind with each other, and gentle with each other and have extra patience. You know, one of the lines that I, I share with my, my uh, patients that I, I learned from, from uh, my mother a long time ago is the quip about, you know, I, I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch, which, which speaks to the fact that being together all the time with no time apart can sometimes be a challenge. And particularly if you're at home you know, on your own is one thing that's lonely, but if you're in a family and everybody's not, every, not everybody is a, 
a happy, happy-go-lucky family. Everybody has their own particular foibles and personality style. It's what makes us who we are. Um, being able to get along with each other, being able to give each, each other enough space, these are all part and parcel of how you manage in this new environment. Now, there's some people who say, not much is different, I stay home anyway. So this is how my life is, but what I do with people coming into the home. Okay, but there are others for whom this is a complete upside down. They used to go to work. Uh, there are financial stressors that are thrown into this. People don't have jobs. The jobs market, the job market has collapsed. So there are so many levels of stress that have been added onto this that we have to at least pay attention to that, recognize that, put it out there, talk about it, and not shy away from the fact that this is a challenging time. This isn't just staying at home because it's fun to stay at home. Uh, this is not the way that societies normally operate. We like to go out and, uh, and meet with people and chat and have a drink together, whatever we like to do, and this is different now, and that in itself is a change and stressful. In terms of staying in touch with your doctors, if uh, there's been a, a recognition that med medication, med medicine, caring, of pe caring for people by this kind of technology, the computer technology, isn't the same as coming in, you put your arm around you, shake your hand, when we'll do that again, Lord alone knows. But this is what, while we cannot do that, we can still be there for you and with you. So we need to make sure that there isn't a, a lack of health care for non-COVID problems. And this is exactly where the ataxia patient community comes in and your families. The care of the patient, care the, the care of the caregiver, uh, making sure that you know that we're listening to you, that we're here for you. We can prescribe medications, we can make diagnoses, we can catch new issues, we can be here as a sounding board. We can even do an exam on the, on the, uh, on the computer. We can watch you walk, we can do the finger to nose testing, we can ask you questions, we can ask you about your mood. If you come up real close to the camera, we can even see your eye movements. So we can do a lot through the video analysis. And for those who don't have the computer to do that, we can even do phone calls and stay in touch with you. And what's made this different now is the insurance companies are seeing this as providing medical care. And so we can spend a day as a physician seeing our patients as if we were in the clinic and we're here for you. And uh, the, we, there was a webinar on this through NAF. Uh, you wanna make sure that you have either a phone or a, a tablet or your computer that you can get onto Zoom, which is pretty easy, which is most people are using. Uh, have your family members help you, with you, help you with that if there's an issue. But I think that's a really helpful way to stay in touch with your, with your not only your caregivers, your doctors, but with your family, your, your, your grandchildren who can, you know, your five-year-old granddaughter can teach you how to do everything you need to do on the computer. Uh, I think that being connected is even more important now than it ever was. And we have the technology Let's take advantage of it and use it for those purposes. Wonderful. Yes, that's 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 absolutely what um, what we've been telling our patients as well with cerebellar ataxia and with other disorders that we are here for you. Um, although we may not be in clinic seeing people face to face, this medium has been working and I've been doing this for the past month and a half very successfully. And people are um, at the other end are also getting used to it because they've been doing this with their other providers, their primary care doctors, their nurse practitioners, etc. Um, so this is catching on and uh, we might be in, you know, 1.0 and we probably will finesse this technology significantly going um, forward. Coming back to the, um, the, a, the, uh, the question of uh, ataxia and susceptibility to infections. Now, I, I read your excellent article um, that you wrote, which will be posted on the NAF website shortly. It is important to recognize why cerebellar ataxia is unique or different, and what is it about cerebellar, certain cerebellar ataxias that can make you more susceptible, where you, where you must exercise um, even more precaution. And one of the, the things that I can think of, there's certain cerebellar ataxias that predispose you to comorbid conditions. The fundamental thing that we learn about COVID-19 is people over a certain age, like 60 or 65, are more susceptible to getting the infection and probably 
probably getting it more severely, people with heart disease, uh, people with diabetes, etc. So I'm going to ask you, Dr. Shmaman, to tell us a little bit about uh, some unique situations with cerebellar ataxia uh, that people need to be concerned about, and if there are certain ataxias that we need to worry about more than others. Right, so we're now we're transitioning from the idea that uh, we're trying to prevent the to trying to prevent the infection with the virus. Uh, what do you do at home to maximize life in the setting of uh, home quarantine? And then the next thing is not now we're sort of getting closer to to the uh, the heat source here is um, what is it about ataxia and the diseases that cause ataxia that make us worry? There's no indication that a person with ataxia will be more likely than anybody else to get the virus. But having having acquired the virus, somehow having acquired the virus, all the methods we tried to to, to uh, institute didn't work, and, and one understands why, because the, the rate is so high, the rate of infection is so high. Um, exactly as you just said, Dr. Kamani, age is the, is the, the highest uh, risk factor. And so the people who are, are perishing in the nursing homes or the older individuals, age is a big is a big risk factor, and it starts to rise in the 60s, high in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And people who have uh, the ataxias that can go on for decades, many of our patients are in their 70s and 80s uh, or in the late 60s. So these are um, that that's number one, the concern about age as a risk factor. Now ataxia comes from the cerebellar motor syndrome, but the genes that cause ataxia don't stay confined to the cerebellum itself. Number one, we know that respiration, pulmonary clearance, coughing, secretions, breathing can be a common problem in, in many of the ataxias. Um, and uh, we're concerned about aspiration pneumonia and trouble swallowing. So that places your airways at risk, and therefore we think that's a higher likelihood of trouble should you get the virus. But we also know that, and we take, for example, Friedreich's ataxia, in which diabetes and, and uh, cardiac difficulties are common in the younger people. You don't have to be an older person. Having these other issues places you at higher risk. And while I'm on Friedreich's ataxia, what a general uh, primary care doctor or in emergency room or ICU doctor may not realize is that somebody who has Friedreich's ataxia coming on in their teens is very different in many ways than somebody who has Friedreich's ataxia coming on in their 40s and 50s. It's a different, the same gene, more of the, more of the gene in a younger person, but a different manifestation. And that's an important conversation to think about as we go into the next stage of what you share with the primary care team taking care of you in the hospital. But it exemplifies the fact that there are other systems that get involved in people who have ataxia. People, for example, who have uh, the immune ataxias are on immune modulating agents. Now, the risk of a getting a more severe infection is if you have an immune disease. So if you have an immune ataxia and you're on immune modulating medications, that raises the likelihood of trouble. However, we don't want you to stop your immune medications because that's going to make your ataxia blow up. So it becomes a, a, a careful uh, balancing act. Uh, from those perspectives. And there are other ataxias that affect more than just the cerebellum itself. And that's the reason why, given that ataxia is the opening story of those system problems that you may be experiencing as a result of the gene that, that uh, you've, you've inherited, uh, that causes these issues. But even if you didn't have a gene, and it's an ataxia of unknown origin, or you had a major stroke, or cerebellitis, or an immune attack, the airway protection is a consistent and common concern in health care maintenance in ataxia. And because the lungs take such a major hit in COVID-19, that's what we have to be concerned about for the severity of the infection should you get it. Yes, that's that's exactly what I was thinking. I get a lot of questions from patients about should we continue our medications or should we not continue our medications? And I, I do feel that while the risk of getting COVID-19 is potential, the risk of stopping your medications and having the underlying condition worsen is fairly imminent. So my standing instruction to patients is if you don't have an infection and you're doing well, please continue your medications as you are, including your medications for ataxia. Well, you do all of this 
and uh, unfortunately you are exposed to COVID-19. Uh, there are two scenarios. One scenario is in you're not grievously ill, you're just a little sick and you can stay at home um, and we have instructions for what to do. We follow the CDC guidelines. I have a standing instruction to my patients and family members to have the general practitioner connect with me so I can guide them. Uh, and so that is the, the less serious of the scenarios. Now, if you have to go to the emergency room, if there's a sudden and terrible turn of health and that you end up in the emergency room and end up in the ICU, for instance, it is doubly important for the team in the hospital, in the emergency room and the ICU to connect with the specialist who is taking care of the person with cerebellar ataxia because ultimately the, the treatment needs to be nuanced, needs to be customized to the individual. Um, and I can think of various ways in which I can help uh, you know, um, the ICU person, or the, the physician understand, particularly in MSAC, when we, you know, when we have a high in incidence of carbon dioxide retention, what, you know, how they can actually help with that, what is a pathophysiology, and without going into the weeds, I think it is important for, for them to connect with us. And I'm going to ask you, Dr. Shmaman, what are your thoughts and your suggestions when one of your patients does end up in the emergency room and the ICU? What what are the things that you, that you think of or that come to your mind? So thankfully it, it hasn't happened yet, uh, but I got an email this morning about one of my patients with the Machado Joseph who uh, has a temperature and a uh, little cough and they're getting concerned, so they're going to get tested. So when I responded on, on the, uh, through the hospital website saying, you know, there are other reasons that somebody who has ataxia and breathing problems may have a fever and, and coughing. So it's good that you're taking care of it, good that you're going to be seen. Uh, should that be the case? Should it be COVID? Um, I think that the, the general idea is to try and keep people at home, uh, to maximize care at home. And so you treat all of the symptoms as will be laid out on the, the guidelines about uh, hydration and uh, fever and trying to keep the appetite going. Uh, I'm not sure if they mentioned chicken soup, but I'm sure that's in there somewhere. Um, just to try and take care of one's health as one would in the case of a severe instance of the flu. And this is, this is obviously much more than that, but in terms of general health and the medications over the counter for that, that one uses for, for uh, uh, cough or for fever, one, one can, uh, I believe one can, one can do all of that. If it gets more troublesome, and here's where you have to make sure that the hospitals are still open, they're still there and don't shy away. Uh, personal protective equipment is now much more freely available. Certainly in our area here in New England, it's much more freely available. Uh, I'm hopeful that in places like New York, where they had a lot of difficulty, things have improved. Uh, people have recognized the importance of PPE, the personal protective equipment for the healthcare providers, and also giving people a mask when they come into the hospital. If you get tested for COVID, if you're coming into the hospital, that's become standard policy. So if you need to go to the hospital, the hospital's there for you. And the hospital care providers are taking care of themselves so they can take care of you. I think that's an important thing to recognize that uh, you're not overburdening the healthcare system if you need care. That's what the care system is there for. So if, if you need them, us, we're here for you. And that's an important thing to know and to, and to be confident about. Um, in terms of things to know about, I think it's, uh, I don't think it's unkind to our general medicine colleagues to say that people are a little uh, uncertain about neurology, and they certainly may not have seen an ataxia patient because it's not that common. And so it's helpful for you to let your ataxia doctor know that you or the family member is in the hospital and to open a line of communication between the doctors taking care of you and your ataxia doctor some, sometimes a simple conversation saying, oh, this patient has spinal cerebellar ataxia type 6, and it gets a cerebellum, uh, there's a long lifespan, you know, go for it. This, this person can get out of it. Uh, there should not be other issues going on here. It's an ataxia coordination, motor control, speech problem. Uh, let's focus on that. On the other hand, if somebody has MSAC, and there's, and there's maybe the blood pressure changes and other issues of bowel and, and the bladder control, uh, that's something that the primary care team needs to know about. 
So you can give your ataxia doctor the opportunity to educate the team taking care of the person who's in the hospital in order to provide optimal care. So it all comes down to a line of communication that we're social distancing, but we're not social isolating. This includes including your ataxia care team into the conversations about what are the optimal approaches to management in the hospital. What's ataxia? What's part of this? Could this thing this person has be a result of COVID or is that part of the underlying condition? It becomes an important conversation for the medical team to have to give them confidence that they know what they're doing and have a better sense of what the underlying problem are, problems are that the patient has that they're taking care of. That's, that's my approach to that. Uh, yes, and that's exactly what, um, that sums it up really well, is please keep the lines of communication open with your ataxia doctor, so they can keep the lines of communication open with the team in the hospital who's taking care of you. Um, not unlike other conditions that we take care of, um, in very advanced situations, we, we have to talk about advanced care planning. This is best done in the outpatient setting, in my opinion, and when there is extreme immobility, when there's problems with swallowing or breathing, and my rule of thumb, it might, it's, it's usually a general consensus, is advanced care planning, palliative care should be discussed. Uh, and uh, it, if the, a situation arises in which um, someone with ataxia has to go on a ventilator, depending upon the kind of ataxia, for instance, you nuanced it by saying the outcomes of SCA6 are likely going to be very different from the outcomes of MSAC, which is unfortunately a relentlessly progressive um, disease with a shorter lifespan. It is important to talk about advanced care planning, palliative care, and hospice. Ideally, that is done beforehand um, and the patient's wishes are known in terms of uh, going on a, a ventilator, um, you know, getting a feeding tube, for instance, um, um, or going through a period of long convalescence. And so I'm going to ask you, Dr. Schmelman, to, to tell us what your thoughts are about that part of, um, uh, that part of care, um, which is not direct medical care, but that deals with palliative care um, and hospice, and when's a good time to talk about that? Uh, so this is a tough topic, but an important one. And I think it's made much more acute and actually cruel, uh, which none of us can avoid, by the fact that uh, certainly up until now, family members have not been allowed into the hospital. So people are fa have been, are facing uh, the end of life on their own. And that's just awful. Uh, and there's no way to sugarcoat that. And the reason for that is they're trying to limit the ongoing exposure of people to a virus to then keep this mushrooming throughout the society. So with that as backdrop, the fact that when one goes into the hospital, one's generally on one's own, which is a completely new experience, both for the patients and families, and frankly, for the caregivers that we have to figure out how to handle that. For the caregivers, uh, we've all seen the news reports of people who are caregivers uh, destroyed by the notion that whereas before they could go in the room and talk with the family and console the family and counsel the family, get information from the family, have an ongoing dialogue with the family, family's not there. So they've had to do this on the phone or, or, or do the lines of communication through the nursing care team who are, are so critical to the survival of our patients and their care. Um, so what do you do then? I think it's probably worth having a conversation in advance. So you know what somebody would want to have happen. And it takes the sting away from the family member that you feel like all the burdens on your shoulder. What am I going to do? What's my responsibility? What's my decision going to be? In a sense, the decision has been already made. You have a sense of what somebody wants. You have a sense of how aggressive they'd like to be or not. And I think that at least in this environment uh, where we have to be not too optimistic, not too pessimistic, but just realistic and just tell it like it is and recognize what the issues are. You know, people are, are drawing up wills, the doctors are drawing up wills that they, the young ones they didn't have one before, just in case something falls off the rails. So being proactive, planning in advance, 
includes this kind of a conversation, exactly what Dr. Kamani is getting at. Um, given uh, all the, the issues that are involved in uh, intubation and maximal care and the survival and the time course, if that's what you want to have happen, then just say so. And then your family members know this is what I want. If that's something that you think I wouldn't want and this is just not worth it for me, then share that information. It's your decision, it's your life, it's your call. But I think what it allows your family members and the caregivers to know is that there has been a conversation about this. You know what your, what your wishes are, your wishes will be respected and it helps take any kind of anxiety superimposed upon the sadness and the grief and the, and the anxiety that goes along with this whole scenario even the conversation that, that Dr. Kamani and I are having now through NAF is a way to try and preempt those negative feelings by saying, we hear you, we see you, we recognize the issues, here are things to chat about, here are things that you can do to take control of your life in what is otherwise an uncontrollable situation. You control those things that you can. Those we can't, we're all just human, we're doing the best we can. So this is one way to try and take ownership of something that you can do something about and I think that's the approach. There's no right or wrong answer for any particular person. It's, it's You make that decision. But we're encouraging you to think about actually having that conversation. So knowing what you would want to help the family and the caregivers. Yes, and uh, it, just to follow up on that, um, uh, that becomes really important. Consensus becomes very important and this is not just specific to cerebellar ataxia advanced ataxia we deal with this on a regular basis in COVID times and people with other conditions as well and that are relentlessly progressive that cause problems with mobility uh, and uh, swallowing and breathing etc i'm going to take a break here for just a second because it's about 9 44 i'm going to pause and see if uh, Lori has some questions from the audience that she would like us to field Yes, well, thank you, Dr. Kamani and Dr. Shaman, for all of that vital information. This has been so helpful. Uh, one question um, that we have is, can the stress from the COVID-19 situation um, make ataxia symptoms worse? We know that uh, the, the neurology is uh, may not be unique, but it's it's quite um expected that the nervous system responds to stress to uh, lack of sleep to fatigue to anxiety uh to uh, things that make one not as in control as oneself as for example alcohol so stress is absolutely recognized as one of the things that won't make your ataxia worse as a disease we don't think but it certainly could mac could exaggerate your underlying symptoms so i think that's correct and the way to address that is to try and recognize that and then do the things that dr kamani was mentioning earlier about exercise and stress relief to try and take care of the symptoms by treating the underlying problem which is the stress which is a stress this is a stressful time but trying to recognize that and take care of it go for a walk spending time with your you know with, with uh, your your grandchildren your children through through the uh, virtual uh, connection uh, playing with the dog I mean whatever whatever you like to do knitting crocheting you know pottering down in the garage with something you like to do that's in your own house I mean the things that that you find to be stress relieving will be helpful for you given exactly this point that stress can make things worse Yes, and I would add exactly what Dr. Schmelman said, stress per se, but also the ramifications of stress. How do you deal with it? Uh, if you stop exercising, if you don't sleep well, um, and if um, you know, you're not eating well, all of that can have a deleterious effect. And then um, it's important to, to, to reach out. Um, you know, I have a patients write to me saying, I think my Parkinson's or my ataxia is getting worse, but I'm also stressed. And that opens a dialogue and I ask them questions. Is this getting suddenly worse? Just because you're stressed does not mean uh, you can't have a worsening of your condition or not get COVID-19. Both can coexist. We have the right 
to be stressed. It's okay to be stressed. How we deal with it is very important. So please reach out to the physician or your social worker and explain the issues that you're having and then get the tips and tricks for um, handling that stress effectively. Um, as Dr. Schmalman said, it does not worsen the ataxia or underlying condition permanently, but it can definitely worsen the symptoms. We may even find that we need to uh, change or tweak doses of medications that work for depression or anxiety. Uh, so that's another reason to stay in touch with your healthcare providers because we can do this if we're hearing it and you're on a low dose of an antidepressant and depression or mood or anxiety are issues, we can bump those doses or, or, or add something else if necessary. So don't be afraid to, uh, to use the healthcare system to make things better for you. We have the medications, they can be very effective. Even though it's a situationally induced situ uh, response, uh, it may still respond to medication if necessary. That's great advice. And we're showing some resources regarding mental health and staying active on the screen right now. And this will be also included in the recording for today's webinar for all of you that um, are not able to take notes or pictures of the slides. Uh, we also have a link to a registry for those with rare disease and COVID-19 called Rare with COVID listed on this slide. Um, Dr. Uh, Kamani and Shmaman, uh, why would it be important for a person with ataxia that has uh, had a uh, COVID-19 um, or has COVID-19 to register on a, in a registry like this? Um, I, I can pick it up. Actually, it, it raises a larger point. I think the most important thing that this will allow us to do is to increase the uh, knowledge base that is so important. COVID is going to be here to stay. Um, so we need to understand what it does, what it does to whom, and then have a sense of why. And once we have that information, the people who are being very clever with their drug development can find ways to interrupt its impact. And this takes us to the other point, which is research in ataxia, which has really taken a back seat through all of this, is going to open up again. We're hearing from the hospitals that the clinical trials in the spinocerebellar ataxia, the trials in uh, multiple system atrophy, these, are, these have been on hold but they're going to slowly start opening back up again. So we'll be able to in, engage in one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions with people who are in the trials to pick them up again and to take people who, who are uh, interested in, in the studies but haven't yet enrolled, take them into the study and get started. So this gets into the idea of, um, and we talked about this at NAP at the last year's meeting and more recently, that uh, patients are, are experts by experience. You are research collaborators, and by uh, engage by sharing your data, uh, if you had COVID and you have one of the attacks uh, with the people who will be looking at this specifically down the road, it may not be me, maybe not, not Kamani, but some one of our junior colleagues or someone's going to pick this up. We need you to be part of that research team, and uh, in the same way that now drugs are coming down the road for ataxia, uh, the impact of COVID on ataxia, if in fact there is one is something that we need to understand. Are Parkinson's patients different than MSA, different from SCA6, different than Friedrich's ataxia, different than you know, Alzheimer's disease? What, what are the impacts on different diseases and how can we understand that better? That's the research arm. So it's thinking forwards, but I think, again, if you take a large picture, take a step back, now is the time to do that. And so I fully endorse that approach and would encourage you to take part in that. Exactly what Dr. Schmelman said, that we need to learn maybe for, you know, another infection down the road that is similar uh, to, corona, uh, to the coronavirus. And plus, we are developing drugs um, for COVID-19. We also want to make sure these drugs don't adversely affect an underlying neurological condition, such as ataxia. And so as much as information as we can get is, is really important and helpful. And uh, yeah, those are exactly my thoughts, Dr. Shmaman. 
All right, thanks for that. Uh, we have a question here from one of our attendees. This person says that they're uh, very at risk adverse. However, in their household, uh, they have a daughter who goes to school and a wife that goes to work. This person has SCA2, uh, but is reasonably healthy otherwise. And asks, uh, should they exercise more to get their lungs as prepared as possible, or what else can they do? Do you want to take that, Brad, Dr. Glenn? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so if, if you are able to exercise more, if you are mobile, um, and if you are able to follow even online exercises, um, I think the webinar we talked about is a good one to start off with. If you need help in terms of moving around and mobility, then, then that help needs to be asked. But as much exercise as you can, you can do is very good. I've been having a dialogue with our physical therapist uh, who saw the webinar and she was very impressed by it. I wanted her opinion and she said that's exactly the information she would give her, um, her patients with ataxia is try to customize it to your level of mobility, which is what the two experts uh, said on the webinar, uh, prevent deconditioning, um, which is very important, and and get in touch with your physical therapist. One of the things that I've been telling my patients is if there are certain sets of exercises that worked for you through your physical therapist before COVID-19, perhaps your physical therapist can redesign or repurpose those exercises into a home exercise program and give it to you so then you have some continuity and then get back to your physical therapist um, after COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. And if you don't have a physical therapist, then get in touch with your ataxia specialist who has connections to physical therapists. They can do an intake over the phone, get an idea of your mobility over the phone, and perhaps design an exercise program for you or direct you to a program online. There are various ways of doing it so the basic and short answer is yes, exercise as much as you can, um, and but definitely, you know, also exercise universal precautions and social distancing uh, to stay in optimum health. Uh, that's that's great. I, I think that uh, the all the things we talked about in terms of preventing infection for you, your your daughter and your wife, when they come in the house, they need to basically put everything in the washing machine, go and have a shower. Uh, you know, shoes somewhere else. Just don't bring that dust inside the house. Um, that's uh, uh, that, that's an, that's an important part of this, I think. Um, both doing everything that Dr. Kamani mentioned and and making sure that people don't bring the the, the virus into the house, uh, obviously by by accident. Um, you know, you can see that everybody's accommodated to this. They're having proms online and they're having uh, you know concerts online. And, and gym, access, gym teachers, gym instructions are doing classes online. People are in their in their their homes and they're demonstrating somewhere else. The physical therapist can do that. Your gym can do that. If they don't do it, I'm sure they'd be happy to think about doing it. So there are ways to be creative about using the video technology. It's uh, you know we're we're in like in a Star Wars generation here. You know like your, your video instructors coming into your house as a hologram, except not a hologram. You had to show on the video screen. So let's just take advantage of that and do everything that we can uh, accommodating to the new reality, just in our own space, not physically in the same space. So I think if you work with your caregivers and your physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, gym instructors, a fitness trainer, whoever you have in your team at whatever level, uh, try and keep that going in the virtual environment. That's great advice. Thank you for your responses on that. Another attendee uh, says that they are a 76 year old retired physician with ataxia, probably SCA6, and is ambulatory if they should contract COVID 19 and have to be hospitalized. Um, their inclination is to receive um, O2 or CPAP and refuse incubation because of high uh, mortality of incubation. What are your thoughts on incubation in elderly with ataxia? 
I don't have enough experience to, to know the answer to that. And you know, what's interesting is I it's actually it's an interesting lack. Maybe Dr. Kimani, you have a uh, similar experience there. We get the numbers of people infected and the numbers who are passing away. I'm not getting a pers I don't have a personal sense of the outcome after intubation. I don't have a personal sense, and I, I, I just the numbers aren't there. They're not sharing them uh, for whatever reason of what the, the the success rate is in one institution versus another. So I can't answer that question. Uh, we know that people, we're seeing anecdotal reports in the news, someone who was ill in an ICU and intubated, now they're coming home and everybody in the, in the street is honking their horns and they got the balloons out and they're wishing, you know, welcoming them home. How common is that? I actually don't know. Uh, Pavan, do you have a sense of that? No, you're absolutely right. I don't, but I do have a sense of what's going on in the ICUs because I've been talking to a few people here and your attendee, uh, you know, he's spot on when he, when he or she says that they don't want to be intubated, but I really do trust our ICU colleagues to only intubate those people who need to be intubated. Mm -hmm. Dr. Schmaman wrote in his article about ataxic breathing. It's very important to recognize that. If breathing is faltering with CPAP or with BiPAP and your wishes are known ahead of time, um, I think um, to be intubated to protect your lungs is something that the ICU doctors uh, decide depending upon the scenario right there. Um, the patient's wishes, of course, are paramount and autonomy is, is very important, but I do trust our ICU doctors to, to uh, make that decision of needing to intubate someone only um, when they need to intubate. And I have to tell you that I have a couple people, not with ataxia, uh, but progressive supranuclear palsy, who were very ill. Um, and uh, it is a incurable disease and it's, um, you know, it's progressive and they did come out of it and they're convalescing. Of course, it was not a very pleasant experience, but as Dr. Schmalman said, we don't know much about the end outcomes of people who are intubated versus not. So it's, it's going to be very difficult and it's got to be very scenario um, based and patient based. Well, thank you both for your thoughts on that topic. This uh, other attendee uh, says that they continue to get their IV IG at home, but they postponed their uh, Rytunax um, at the hospital for fear of COVID. Are they right for making that decision or should they go to the hospital to get their meds? It depends where you are. Some of these uh, institutions have uh, infusion therapy centers outside of the hospital. Um, I think that uh, you could talk with the care team. Uh, you know, hospitals are, are dividing up. So when you come in the hospital, it says if you have a cough or you think you have COVID, go that direction. If you think you don't have, you have something else, go that direction. So, so they're, they're, they're physically separating known, known or suspected COVID from everybody else. And some of the larger institutions have some hospitals in their system that are COVID and others that are not COVID. So I think it, it's very de institution dependent. But again, I think to, to emphasize a point that Dr. Kimani was making earlier, we don't want you to give up on your care because you're afraid of COVID. I think ask your doctor and you say, I don't want to catch the bug. Can you tell me that are you going to put me in some place that I'm going to not be exposed above more, more than I would be if I went to the supermarket uh, to to uh, this this virus. And I think that could be one way to give you some sense of certainty that they've got they've got your back on this. Yeah, exactly what Dr. Schmaman said. I think you've made all the most relevant points on that. Yeah. And we have some attendees with some questions regarding children with ataxia. Um, this attendee has a son that's five years old with SCA 13 and uh, would like to know what your thoughts are on when it would be optimal for this child to return to kindergarten. Would it be advisable to say that this person should stay at home until there's a vaccine or uh, sooner? 
This will depend very heavily on what the testing situation does, uh, whether whether the child has been exposed, whether the child has antibodies, uh, whether the people in the in the the uh, uh, child care centre or the the school um, have themselves been tested. I think this is going. This is a larger societal question. When if you if you're concerned about your child healthy or not, uh, going back into an environment where they could be exposed, what is the risk? And this is the unknown. This is what the fuss is about. This is the whole business of can we open up society? When do you go back out there again? So we're basically we're all in the same boat on this. Uh, when can we go to a concert again? When can you go to school again? When you can you go to a restaurant again? Uh, this is uh, and and we we don't we don't do politics here. We just do science and the care of our patients. And and the thing that we're that we're we're hoping that we're waiting for is more information about certainty about exposure or non-exposure of the environment that you're in and that you're planning on going back into. And I think that's the answer to that question. It's uh, it's an important question. It gets to the issue of opening back up again. And I don't know that we're any more qualified to answer that than anybody else, uh, except for the fact that, uh, that somebody, a child who has ataxia could have more downside if you get infected. And that's what we've talked about through the hour. Exactly right. Very, uh, very scenario dependent and would follow the rules of the kindergarten of the child has already been to kindergarten before. I'm sure the teachers know that they have SCA 13 and it is, a, you know, they would probably be the best to inform the family whether they have resources to take care of the child when the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. So absolutely check with their rules and regulations. I would, I would say don't assume uh, that the child will not be taken care of, just like don't assume uh, that you would get COVID-19 if uh, you go to the hospital. It's, it's amazing how the medical community has come together at warp speed uh, in terms terms of getting treatment um, for our patients. Um, and I really salute those doctors, nurses, MAs, everybody at the front line of the hospitals who are taking care um, of patients. And we have really repurposed our hospitals and clinic to become, um, you know, uh, to reduce the risk of infection. So, so please check with your individual institutions um, before you make that decision. That's great advice. One of our attendees would also like to get your thoughts on when a vaccine for COVID-19 will be ready, what the progress is on that front, um, and when a vaccine is available, um, will it be safe? So we have to get our crystal ball out on that one. Uh, I, they're not going to bring out a vaccine until they know that it's been tested. That's that's why it takes so long. The last part is is a key question, key to the question. Uh, will it be safe? So they can they can take the viruses and make little uh, antibodies to them and, and make a, a vaccine out of that. But they need to know that it's safe and not going to hurt people. So they will deliver that to a lot of people, um, thousands, uh, as part of the clinical trial to make sure it's okay. Uh, and at that point, when they come out and say it's safe, uh, then uh, they would go ahead and, and introduce it. I would use the opportunity to make sure that we don't get stuck in the bind that people who have kids are not getting them vaccinated for everything else. So measles, mumps, rubella, the stuff that kills, whooping cough. Um, these vaccinations are key. Uh, they have been lifesavers. And I think if anything, uh, I don't mean to stand on, on a soapbox here, but if anything, the lack of a vaccine for COVID-19 and the mayhem that it has caused personally, medically, uh, death-wise, economically, uh, is like what would happen in the old days before the vaccines for all the diseases that we have now. And if anything ever should shut down the anti-vaxxer movement for good, it should be this, and that day can't come too soon. So uh, the vaccination, when they produce one, will have been through the rigors of vaccination testing, and uh, hopefully that will be a game changer for this and relegate COVID-19 to the uh, rest of the historical record of things like smallpox and those things that have uh, that used to be disappeared until uh, they came back again in little bits and pieces because of a uh, lack of vaccination. So excuse the politics there, but that's really, we, we in the medical profession, when it comes to vaccination, and nothing gets us more upset than the misinformation and the disinformation 
and the lies about vaccines that have saved uh, countless millions of people by preventing the diseases exactly like what we're going through now. COVID-19 is a poster child for the mayhem in the absence of a vaccine. I wasn't sure I was going to go there, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> Spot on. Um, and the other thing is appropriate testing. Um, that, that those are the two fundamental things we need. Yeah. Thank you for talking about uh, an important topic around vaccination. Um, one more uh, topic area um, before we conclude our webinar today is, are there any positives from the COVID-19 experience that you can share your thoughts on? Oh yeah, you know, there, there are so, actually there are so many, it's remarkable. Um, I think that uh, people have reached out to each other. Uh, we've discovered technology like this. Uh, we are uh, recognizing our resilience as a society. We're recognizing that uh, people are stronger together than apart, and even if they're not physically together, they're still stronger together as a society, uh, that we are resourceful, uh, that we know how to follow rules by and large. Um, and I, I think that the, uh, the changes that will come out of this are, are still unpredictable. Uh, we, know who, we know who's essential. Uh, we know how to at least to acknowledge what needs to be done in terms of making sure that society works going forwards. Um, and I think we know how to, to uh, by and large, uh, filter out uh, truth from non-truth. And um, you can't hide that. When people are dying in their tens of thousands and getting infected in, in millions upon millions, um, the, the science has a way of making itself clear. And I think that as a society, We've found our strength and our stride, and uh, it confirms, reaffirms our, our belief in, in the humanity of each other and in the, the, uh, the, the goodness of people, uh, whether it's the, the people who are taking care of patients in the front lines or the people who are applauding them at seven o'clock in the evening from their balconies around the world. Uh, I think there's a lot of good that comes out of it. And it all stems from the human condition and human resilience. And that's what we have to rely on and build upon as we go forward. I can agree more. Empathy, compassion, and most important, honesty, a good hard look at ourselves um, as a society, as a healthcare setting. I hate to quote politicians, but someone said, never waste a crisis. And <laughs> it, is, um, it is important to, to recognize and realize this crisis, as you may, has laid threadbare the loopholes uh, in our society and our healthcare system. And it is now that we should come together, be really honest about it and patch it all together and, and prepare for the next one whenever it happens. Uh, but exactly what Dr. Shmaman said, it is a good reflection of who we are. Um, and that, that empathy and compassion is, is one of the two, two things that I've learned and, and really being honest with ourselves. And thank you, Laurie, to you and for NAF for being such leaders in uh, taking taking charge of our our corner of the field, which is working with the people that we are charged with, which is the folks who are dealing with the cerebellar disorders in their larger uh, larger perspective. To make sure that you know that we're here for you uh, individually as caregivers, as hospitals, as a national team. And so thank you to you all for for the leadership that you that you're providing and continuing to provide. Uh, increasingly as we as we go forwards and as we will work towards cures for ataxia when we can focus on the ataxia on its own without all this other uh, difficult challenge that got thrown in our laps with the COVID-19. Well thank you Dr. Schmaman for the kind words of appreciation for um, our work and our team and what we're trying to do for the ataxia community and adapting to virtual tools like this to get education out there and continue to connect to each other. I think that those are all very important points that you both shared as what is emerging uh, from this global pandemic. 
And so that is all we have time for today. It's been a great discussion. I think we've shared a lot of important information. And any final thoughts that you uh, both would like to share? My final thought is exactly what Dr. Schmalmans is thanking you, thanking Stephanie in the background, uh, the behind the scenes folks, thanking Sue, and truly really thanking Dr. Schmalman for having me um, on this program as a co-presenter. That is an honor course last but not the least thanking all of those people who tuned in uh to 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 listen to to this in the middle of today so yeah very grateful thank you thank you Dr. Kumani. well thank you both for sharing your knowledge on this important topic and like to thank all of our attendees for tuning in today and as a reminder a recording of today's webinar will be made available Thank you all and take care and stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.